and welcome to Blank Park Zoo's Hope for the Wild. Today we are on a journey to discover, connect, and take action for the eastern black rhino. Black rhinos are considered to be critically endangered with a population around 6,487 across Africa. Since 1996, intense anti-poaching efforts and strategic translocations to safer areas have allowed this species to slowly recover. During this program, you'll have the opportunity to discover how our conservation partners, the International Rhino Foundation and the Black Mambas work with the communities that live alongside black rhinos to secure sustainable livelihoods and live in harmony with local wildlife. Local communities are key to the black rhino conservation. You will also have the opportunity to connect with residents, black rhinos, Ayana, Tumani, and Kamara. Animal care and education staff will provide a behind the scenes look of what it takes to care for black rhinos and share their knowledge of what it makes black rhinos unique. Blank Bark Zoo is proud to live our mission to inspire an appreciation of the natural world through conservation, education, research, and recreation. As a member of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we work collectively to save animals in the wild from extinction. We hope you enjoy the program and feel inspired to discover connect and take action for the wild. An eastern black rhino is one of the subspecies of black rhinos. So there's two species in Africa, the white and the black rhino. So ways to tell the black and white rhino apart is by looking at their lips. So the black rhino has a triangle shaped lip um, and they use that to grasp trees and brush um, and pull it into their mouth. Whereas the white rhino, they're more of like a lawnmower and they're pulling in grasses off the ground, so they have more of a square shape. Eastern black rhinos can be found in eastern and southern Africa um, in the grasslands and open savannas. So eastern black rhinos are critically endangered. Um, black rhinos specifically went through a reduction of 96% of their population between 1970 and 1993. So they went from 65,000 rhinos to about 2,300. Um, and that was mostly due to poaching. Um, so now we've been working on different anti-poaching strategies and we've actually brought that number back up to 6,500 rhinos. About a thousand of those though are eastern black rhinos. A lot of times it's viewed as like a status symbol to have rhino horn or it, it's in certain cultures viewed as like a medicinal quality. But really it's just made out of keratin just like our um, hair and nails. So black rhinos are a keystone species for Africa, so that means they hold um, a large effect on their environment. So their role is important because not only are they a huge charismatic species, so you know they're bringing attention to Africa in that region. So anytime you're helping a black rhino, you're helping several species in that in that area. So rhinos wallow to coat themselves in mud. It's really great for. Um, like protecting themselves from the sun or creating like moisture in their skin and also like for bugs. Um, but by wallowing, they're creating like mini dams essentially. So smaller hoof stock and other animals that um, don't want to go into the thicker, deeper mud, they're able to drink from these smaller wallows that are safer from predation. Another thing that they do, so they have midden piles. So that's where they um, put their dung is <laughs> in a midden pile. Um, and dung beetles will come along and take a, a pellet and they'll roll it away. So effectively they're fertilizing the soil, but also the dung beetles are um, able to use that and lay their eggs. So it's good for the dung beetles as well. And if you've heard of oxpeckers, so they'll eat the bugs off of rhinos. So anytime that rhino populations go down, these insects populations go down as well and then you don't have the food for the oxpeckers. So there's kind of creating like a symbiotic relationship in that way too. We start off every morning by cleaning the yard. Um, so to clean the yard, we'll start with raking up all their hay, picking up any browse that our rhinos didn't consume overnight, um, and then cleaning up their midden piles. They get browse twice a day. Um, as you can see, we have some left over from last night, so they don't always eat all of it. Um, it kind of depends on this kind of browse. So their favorite is probably mulberry, which is some of the stuff I have here. Um, so they usually eat all of that stuff. And then one cool thing that we do here is we actually chip 
all of our old sticks that we don't use throughout the day and stuff. So in the winter when we don't have as much browse, um, our girls are still getting browse just in the form of wood chips. Um, so we chip them and then we give them piles of wood chips in the winter. In both yards, we have like a designated poop spot for them. Um, they are the ones that decide it, but it's called a midden pile. Midden piles are really important, so other rhinos can tell a lot based on poop, basically. So they'll, you'll notice the girls will often like smell the poop and just be interested in it. So their middens can tell a lot about other rhinos. They can tell age, gender, if they're sexually mature, that kind of stuff. So it's really important in the wild, especially because black rhinos are solitary animals, so they don't come in contact with a lot of rhinos all that often. Also notice if you ever see them go, they will kick when they're going to the bathroom as well sometimes. Um, and this is important because they'll get their feces on their feet so that when they travel they can still spread that smell to other places. So their poop is just really full of a lot of hormones and that's why they go in the same spot every day which makes it a lot easier for us as well. But yeah, it's super important and especially with the groups being separated, the girls can kind of check up on each other and just see how they're doing when they uh, go over and smell, smell their waste. So right now we have three female rhinos. Two of them were born here. One was brought in when she was about two years old. So mom is Ayana. She was born in 2010, so she's gonna be 14 this year. She was one of our founders here with Kiana, who is now at a different facility, and she mothered the two females that are still here. We also have her first daughter, Tumani. She was born in 2016, so she is seven years old. And Kamara, her younger daughter, who was born in 2019, and she just turned five. So something about all of them is Ayana is more of like a laid back personality. Her children are a little bit more excitable. Kamara is the one that's currently housed with her, and she is definitely the most vocal. So if you hear somebody talking, it's most likely to be Kamara. Tumani is a little bit more cautious, but with those she's comfortable around, really. She is, they're all really sweet and gentle and love belly rubs and just getting some attention. We first got rhinos in 2012 and so that was Ayana and Kiano. They were both about two years old because they were both born in 2010 and so they are the parents of both of our offspring here currently. We have eastern black rhinos and they are considered critically endangered so it's really really important for their conservation and also guests super love seeing big exciting animals that you can't see anywhere else so it has great guest appeal and it's also really great for conservation. There are fewer than 100 black rhinos in captivity in America. I think there are around 60. So with such a small genetic pool, we have to really make sure that we're being wise about any breeding that we do. So the SSP really helps with that to make sure that we still maintain a genetically diverse population even when it is a relatively small population. An SSP stands for Species Survival Plan, and so it's basically a way to maintain genetically diverse populations in captivity. There are people in charge of the SSP for each individual species that's a part of it, and they give breeding recommendations, they look at genetics, and they recommend who should and shouldn't breed and help us to make sure that we are maintaining genetic diversity, especially in such a small population like black rhinos. So we had Keanu here, he was our male, so he's the father of Kamara and Tumani. He actually went to Caldwell Zoo in Tyler, Texas. He, at that point, was recommended by the SSP, or Species Survival Plan, to be moved there. So that was a, from a genetic perspective, he had produced calves. What he gave to the population had been fulfilled. So now he is in Caldwell, living his best life there. Howdy everyone, this is Keanu, our black rhino here at the Caldwell Zoo. He has a birthday coming up on October 7th. He's turning 14 years old. And along with you, we wanted to wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Keanu. still loves all the same things that he had at Blank Park. He loves his carrots and sweet potatoes. He also makes some beautiful work of art for our visitors here at the zoo. He also is the sweetest black rhino that you'd ever find. And while he is over breeding age as of right now, Keanu here has done his part for his species and his population. He has sired two calves in the past. And so now he's spending the rest of his retirement here at the Caldwell Zoo, which we absolutely love. So we are super honored to have him here, as well as get to take care of him every day. And a good way that we can do that is we just give him lots of love and lots of scrubs.
First thing we do in the mornings is we separate these guys out. They all get individual AM diets. So we'll shut them off from uh, outdoor viewing, get them separated, get their AM diets in, and while they're eating those, we'll get outside and clean up the outdoor exhibits for them for the rest of the day. So this barn's pretty nice because we have uh, hydraulic doors throughout the entire barn. So it makes it easy to uh, separate when needed and easy to control. So you have a lot more control with these doors than you would like a, a sliders or anything. And with a big animal, you need some beefy protection. So on each door for the rhino stalls, we have a sign that says whether there's an animal on, in the stall or not. So this is just an extra layer of protection for us keepers because there are blind spots in every barn. So this is a way for us to ensure that we're not entering a space with the rhinos, just an extra layer of safety that we take, especially with uh, large animals like this. All right. All right. Well, now that we've got them all separated, I'll uh, get their AM diets. Of course, you gotta get some scratches in in the middle of it, so. So this is just a liquid vitamin E that we'll put on their grain for them. And this is just a extra supplement, kind of helps with their skin health and stuff like that. And this is a set amount that's set by our uh, veterinary team. And we make sure they get this every day. All right, ladies. I know you're starving. Put Kamara's hay and sometimes they get a little excited for morning feed so you might see them kind of toss their horn at the hay a little bit and that's just their excitement kind of like your dog jumping on you when you get home she's excited to get her morning food and then we'll put her green in and that's what we'll put her uh, vitamin E on and they like to wear their hay sometimes too Black rhinos tend to actually be a solitary species. So for example, in about 2022, uh, Tumani started separating herself from the other two females. We were housing the three of them together and our male separately when we had him. She was starting to separate herself, be more independent. And around that time, she actually had an injury to her horn. In the end, we ended up actually choosing to remove it to prevent risk of infection because it can be very severe when it gets into that sinus cavity. Since we think it was caused by sparring with the other girls as well, a little bit harder than we would want, we started separating her and managing her medical care separately, and she's been housed separately ever since. If you were to see her now, you would never know that that happened, but it is a really great way to tell her and Kamara apart because they are very, very similar in size. So if you look at Tumani, her front horn is actually shorter than her second horn, where it's opposite in both of the other girls. So right now our rhinos are housed, we have two of them housed together, Ayana and Kamara. That is our youngest daughter. So even though she's five years old in the wild, that would normally be her going out on her own. But here she doesn't have breeding opportunities and she is super attached to mom. It's kind of a more logistical thing. When If we were to get a breeding recommendation and wanting to send her out, if we got a timeline, we would definitely start separating her out so that she's used to being away from mom. But right now it's kind of where her comfort level is at. We separated Tumani out when she started doing that herself. So if we start seeing behavior where Kamara does start self-separating, then we would also manage them differently. But right now this is where they're happy. Black rhinos are typically solitary in the wild. The males have their entirely own home range. Females might interact or overlap. So they're maybe a little more social than the males, but overall generally solitary. Or at one point we had all three females together. So we based that model off of Cleveland Park Zoo. So they had put their females together and they had had success for it. So knowing that they do kind of socialize sometimes with females in the wild, we knew that it was possible. The personalities of our females that we had, you know, Ayana, the mom, she's very laid back, easygoing. The idea that we could put the females together was pretty high success rate. So we started doing slow intros with them, um, with the two calves, Kamara and Tumani. And that went really well, so we were able to add Ayana in the same day. And within three weeks, we had all of them together exclusively all the time, which was really amazing because not a lot of zoos do that. And being able to do that will create opportunities to have more black rhinos at each facility in the future. Oh. 
Hey, Mama. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite because then you can see it underneath her feet. And her like, little pads she got there. And then her little belly button. We do training with our rhinos every morning. We get them in, this is called the Tamer or the RRD. We have a built-in scale in here so that we can get their weight every single morning. And we'll just do some basic behaviors. Our primary trainers like Kayla here um, will do more advanced behaviors that aren't solidified yet. So for our basic behaviors or if it's just the rhino barn keeper that day, we'll just get eyes on our rhinos. So basically just checking their body condition, um, our rhinos will sometimes spar, so around their horns typically we'll see some little cuts or wounds, but they're really hardy animals, so it's not too concerning. We just like to put some SSD or something on there to help with, keep flies away from it, that kind of stuff. And we'll also do like a open behavior with their mouths just to get a look on their teeth, make sure we don't have any like super sharp edges on their teeth, and just make sure they don't have any sores or anything in their mouths. Kayla's working on right here is placing Kamara's foot on a block. Um, these behaviors are super important because we do maintenance on their toes for them. Rhinos have three toes. Um, they're flat-footed when they walk, so our goal is to trim their toes so that the toe, if this is the ground, we don't want the toe going down so that they're placing a lot of pressure on it. So when we trim their nails, we'll do it at like a 45 degree angle just so it's a flat surface for them. All our girls are really good with tactile, so it's not a huge issue to get the behavior done. It's more so getting them to finally place their feet on blocks. And when we do their nails, it's just like a big file. It's a rasp is what we use, but essentially we're just filing their nails. So another behavior that we train for is blood draw. These guys get their blood drawn quarterly, so every three months. Basically all we're doing is desensitizing them or getting them used to being poked with a needle. Their skin is super rough, so it does take a lot of pressure to be able to do that. So typically we go in like one area, you can kind of find it here. If you kind of rub back and forth, you can feel it. And you kind of just go between the grooves when we poke. Um, are you ready? Yeah. Poke. So I just say poke right before I'm about to do it just so that they know that the poke is coming. Um, and then I keep applying pressure there until I hear Kayla bridge, um, which is that whistle again. But yeah, so we can go in two different spots for them. So we either do high or low and we go right above this joint right here. Um, we either go right above it or we can go lower down here. But yeah, their veins can be super hard to find. So we kind of just, a lot of guesswork until you can actually find it in there. Um, but then we'll do low. Are you ready, Kayla? Poke. Our rhino's favorite food is probably what we call browse. So that refers to like leafy trees and shrubs that we uh, provide them. They get browsed twice a day, every single day. Even in the winter time, we browse them. We have a browse freezer that's a couple years old. So we're able to freeze brow fresh browse for them. So in the winter, they're still getting something that's super important to their diet. So beyond being important to their diet, they also love it. I think I would say that their favorites are probably mulberry, they also really like elm, but a lot of the invasive species that we don't super want as humans, they love to eat. So it's a really good relationship that we're able to build with parks departments, with our horticulture team, and then they get to take advantage of that as well. Iron overload is really common in captive rhinos more so than in the wild. It's not really um, observed in the wild, but up to 30% of rhinos in captivity are observed to have iron overload, which just means that the body stores more iron than it should. And so we manage their diet in just that we do an analysis of everything that we feed them out and we make sure that levels aren't too high. We've modified their diets because they used to get alfalfa hay and now they get grass hay just to kind of be cognizant of that. When we had a male that was a little bit more borderline on having a little bit higher iron levels, we would even take the seeds of his pumpkins to because the seeds are a lot higher in iron, but the rest of the pumpkin is pretty good for them. And so we're just always cognizant of their, the iron levels of everything that we feed them. And so we have a pretty solid diet now of, of a good level. And we also get quarterly blood on all of our rhinos so that we can make sure that their levels are good. And, and so that we're always thinking ahead to make sure that if we need to make more modifications, we're on top of it before it becomes an actual problem with any of our rhinos. Because right now they're all in a healthy iron level. Scientists don't really know what causes it. There are some different theories out there. 
just that different genetics, less variety in diet and captivity, just depending on different availability. One of the theories is to do with um, that iron overload actually wouldn't be a problem in the wild because there's more parasitism in the wild, so it actually helps combat that. So there are different working theories, but there's no like settled like consensus on what, on what actually causes it more in captivity than the wild. The way that we as keepers promote their wild behaviors are in a variety of ways. One is by giving them browse, because browsing is a really important behavior, especially for black rhinos. White rhinos have the flat lip because they primarily graze. Black rhinos have that pointed lip because they primarily browse. So giving them browse and allowing them to have actual branches to be stripping the leaves off of eating the bark, moving around manipulating is really important. So another way that we promote natural behaviors in our rhinos is by providing enrichment. So we swap out their enrichment items every other day, but we rotate what yard they're in every day. So that means that every day the, each group of rhinos is getting a new set of enrichment items. Um, so they have different things that they can graze in, play with, with their horns, manipulate on the ground. So that also promotes natural behaviors. And uh, another natural behavior that's super important that we like to promote, especially in the summertime when it's easier, is wallowing. The benefits of mud are it acts as natural sunscreen, it acts as a protectant from bugs, and it keeps them cool when it gets really hot. So it's really important for them to have that option and it's a great natural behavior for them to be exhibiting. People don't care as much about things that they don't see and they don't understand. So it's just people seeing these amazing animals up close and personal, getting to hear their stories, makes them want to care and support different conservation efforts. And then breeding is super important because it is a critically endangered species. Intelligently breeding, following our SSPs and promoting genetic diversity, even if they're just staying in the wild, even for the next couple generations, will help us promote efforts to reintroduce back into the wild one day is always the goal. But we have to have a really robust population to be able to even consider efforts like that. And so right now we're just really working to get them out of that critically endangered point for conservation. Black rhinos are a part of the zoo's Saving the Wild Conservation Priorities Program. This program was developed to connect our zoo community with the animals that are in our care and the organizations that protect them in the wild. We are proud to partner with the International Rhino Foundation and the Black Mambas to save rhinos in the wild. Hi, I'm Nina Fassion, Executive Director of the International Rhino Foundation. At IRF, our mission is very clear, to ensure the survival of the world's rhino species through strategic partnerships, adequate protections, and scientifically sound interventions. For more than 30 years, we have been safeguarding the world's rhinos, working in Africa and Asia to protect these magnificent animals from the threats they face, including poaching and habitat loss. Our vision is simple, a world where rhinos thrive in the wild. Through our three strategic pillars, saving rhinos, engaging people, and protecting habitats, we continue to fight for a future where these iconic creatures can live safely in their natural habitats. Today, we're excited to share with you the story of one remarkable young rhino who embodies the resilience and hope that drive our mission every day. Thank you for supporting rhinos. On the morning of July 17, 2020, an anti-poaching patrol unit found the tracks of a poacher leading them to the body of a young black rhino cow. Nearby, they saw the footprints of a small rhino calf running away. These footprints belonged to a 16-month-old rhino calf, too young to survive alone in lion country, especially with an injury. Our partners at the Lowveld Rhino Trust quickly organized her capture and called in a vet from Harare. The team worked to immobilize the calf, clean her wounds, and give her antibiotics. Her injuries were severe, caused by a heavy caliber rifle. She was taken to a specially constructed rhino boma, safe from predators. She was scared and in pain, so she lashed out at her new surroundings, even knocking off her front foot in frustration. This little rhino had a lot of fight. For the first week, she walked from pen to pen, calling for her mother. The team spent countless hours alongside her boma, making soothing, rhino noises so she wouldn't feel alone. She was called Pumpkin for the soothing sound of the word. As her anger faded, Pumpkin's true character began to show. She earned the nickname Princess Pumpkin for her fussy eating habits and amusing little tantrums. Her favorite trick, flipping her food bowl to eat her favorite bits first. 
As her injuries healed, she pranced around the boma, tail in the air and snorting. After six weeks, her legs were healthy and her spirit was strong. It was time for Princess Pumpkin to return to the wild. During her stay, she had secret night visits from Rocky, another young orphan black rhino. In the mornings, you would see his spore where he had been circling her enclosure. A few days after her release, our monitors found her tracks with Rockies not far behind. We believe they've joined together, creating a new bond. Princess Pumpkin's story is a testament to resilience and hope. Despite the challenges of poaching, her strength and the dedication of our partners at the Lowveld Rhino Trust and elsewhere remind us that together we can create a future where rhinos thrive in the wild. The mission of the Black Mamas is to select, train, and deploy highly skilled rural women from targeted communities and build environmental patriotism for this landscape and all wildlife through a multi-generational and non-violent approach. In 2012, South Africa saw a rise in rhino poaching. The Greater Kruger became a target. Transfrontier Africa, headed by Craig Spencer, had to realign its work to make sure rhinos in their protected areas were not targeted by poachers. Old militarized approach to anti-poaching was not enough anymore. The situation required quick thinking outside of the box. This is where a new innovative model of the Black Mambas was born. In 2013, Transfrontier Africa established the Black Mamba All Women Anti-Poaching Unit as a response to the escalating rhino poaching crisis. The new model implied recruitment and training of young rural women who are traditionally have been primary caregivers and the source of values, morals, and ethics in their families. In other words, this new APU model would invest into key role players in changing perceptions around wildlife, the environment, and poaching in the Greater Kruger, reconnecting communities and protecting areas, and raising a new environmentally conscious generation of South Africans. The Black Mambas have three pillars of strength, which include conservation, taking a holistic approach to wildlife conservation to involve the whole community. Education, early conservation education lays a solid foundation for wildlife and the environment. An example of this is their Bush Babies program, which taught 900 children in 2023. Women empowerment. They believe when you empower women, we empower the community. When it comes to anti-poaching, the Black Mambas have a winning approach. The Black Mamba Project aims to gather valuable data on rhino poacher behavior, enabling the development of effective counter-poaching strategies. The objective is to render the area an unattractive target for poachers, making the risks outweigh the rewards. To make their strategy even more effective, in 2022, they trained and recruited five Mambas for their new Crime Prevention Unit, which focuses on wildlife crime hotspots. To learn more about the Black Mambas and their programs, visit their website at transfrontierafrica.org backslash Black Mambas. All right, so we're out kind of behind the scenes here with some of our uh, exhibits and we're getting ready to cut some brows for all of our animals. Uh, so we do daily browse cutting for all of our animals on our team, uh, rhinos, giraffe, pretty much any of the herbivores that we have will uh, consume browse. So we do a lot of cutting daily, uh, a lot of invasive species, so honeysuckle, mulberry, it's kind of a double win. We get food to feed the animals and we're helping control these invasive species. Um, we also have a program called Upcycle that we help with, and that's we get volunteers that come we meet them and they actually help take out invasive species as well and we get to bring that back to the zoo for the animals so it's a win-win for everybody. So when we're cutting for giraffe, we tend to look for bigger, bigger chunks that have Ys that we can easily hang for them. Um, some of the other species it's not as important but for the giraffe since we hang exhibit brows for them as well as indoor, but we'll try to get some nice pieces today that we can hang on exhibit for our giraffe so that they can enjoy while they're out there for everyone to see. So 
so we'll duck in here. We're lucky we have quite a few places here on site that you can we are, we're able to cut. And then we have relationships with some of the other uh, parks and stuff around here that allow us actually to go off site, off site and cut some uh, browse for the animals. A lot of the stuff that we will cut will end up being honeysuckle with it being as invasive as it is. It pretty much grows back as soon as it's cut. So pretty much guaranteed to have a constant supply of honeysuckle. A lot of our animals like rhinos, for example, are uh, browsers in the wild naturally. So in the wild, they'd be eating more of like the bushy leafy stuff. So it's important that we uh, try to give them that opportunity here. And it's important for not only the ruminants, but our rear uh, or our hind gut fermenters like rhinos, it's important for that gut health. It maintains those healthy microbes that help them actually break down the plant material that we can't produce or process. And browse identification, that's something that is really big for our team, seeing as that most of our animals are uh, browsers. So we actually have um, photo IDs that we can use for everybody to kind of learn the, the species that we want and the species that we don't want. And that's kind of part of our onboard training with any new keepers. All right, let's take a look at what we got. I'll drag this out so I can see if I've got a sufficient amount. Uh, so a lot of the animals like our giraffe, they'll mainly um, eat just the leaves. Some of the species like mulberry, they'll actually strip the bark off. Our rhinos, they'll eat the entire branch. You know, they've, their teeth are designed to crush and mash wood to a pulp. So a lot of times you'll come in in the mornings and there'll just be little piles of chewed wood pulp on the floor. And we do have our browse list and donation directions on our website. If anyone ever is interested in donating, you can get all the information off of there. Um, and that'll usually give you, get you in contact with one of us on the team that we can arrange a delivery. All right, so here we are outside of our browse freezer. We were lucky enough that uh, one of our donators that donated browse regularly happened to have a walk-in freezer just out in his pasture. And uh, so he donated it to us. We've got it up and running and now we're able to store um, freeze browse over the winter for animal, all the animals that need it here at the zoo. Uh, so this is a great step forward for us. So previously, Obviously with Iowa winters, you don't have access to uh, fresh browse year round. So we would often save like mulberry sticks and stuff for the giraffe to chew on and do our best to supplement that in the winter time. But with this, now we're able to freeze browse uh, throughout the summer so that we're able to feed that out through the winter and uh, give them that, because it is important for especially giraffe for that gut health with the ruminants and stuff. And in the wild, that's their primary diet. So we want to, mimic that as closely as possible. So this is a, a huge step forward for us. All right, so uh, in our browse freezer, we actually have got lucky and got donations for a lot of these totes, and then we purchased some of our own, but this helps us keep it organized. We're able, you can see they're all numbered, so we can, we keep track of when and where we've cut everything. And then uh, as we feed it out, we're able to track uh, where that came from, just in case there ever were any issues, we'd be able to identify them but it makes it super easy to keep it uh, pretty clean and tidy in here and easily accessible for everybody. Freezing it, you will get some that will like wilt a little bit, but for the most part, it maintains the green color and stays pretty solid for them. There's a few species that freeze better than others, uh, but for the most part, anything we can keep for them is beneficial. 
Hello everyone, my name is Ben and I'm one of the educators here at Blank Park Zoo. One of my favorite things about rhinos is they're surprisingly diverse. Typically when people see a rhino, they think it's just a rhino, but there's actually five different species of rhino. The species we have here at Blank Park Zoo is the Eastern Black Rhino. They have a pointed lip that allows them to grab onto tree branches. There's also the White Rhino, which has a square-shaped lip, and they're the second largest land animal behind elephants. Then there's the Indian Rhino, or the Greater One-Horned Rhino. They have thick folds of skin that look almost like armor. There's the Sumatran Rhino, which is the hairiest species of rhino. And then there's the Javan Rhino, which is one of the rarest species, with only about 75 individuals left in their natural habitat. There's a lot of confusion in what's a horn, what's an antler, and what's a tusk. So here's a little bit of a quick crash course. The big difference between the three is the material they're made out of. Horns, like this antelope horn in the horns of our rhinos, are made out of keratin, which is the same stuff our fingernails are made out of. Antlers, like this deer antler, are made out of bone, and they're shed once a year. Tusks, like this hippo tusk, are specialized teeth. One of the most iconic features of rhinos are their horns. Now this is not a real rhino horn, this is a replica, but it does give you a good idea of how big their horns can be. They're made out of keratin, just like our fingernails are, and they can weigh up to 10 pounds, which is about as heavy as a gallon of milk. So if you can imagine holding a gallon of milk on your face, that's what it would be like to be a rhino. That's why they have those big shoulders that allow them to hold their heads up above the ground. Now they can use their horns for a variety of things. Their main purpose is for defense from predators. They can also use them to protect their calves. They can spar with other rhinos. They can even use them to dig for water or break branches to eat. Today, all rhino species are from Africa and Asia, but the earliest rhinos were from right here in North America, but you probably wouldn't recognize them because the earliest rhinos didn't actually have horns. Instead, scientists define a rhino by their teeth. Rhinos also used to be way more diverse than they are now. Nowadays, we have five species of rhino, but rhinos used to come in all different shapes, sizes, and forms. This little guy here is a Megacerops. Now, while this guy looks like a rhino, he is a little bit more of a distant relative, and scientists have found that they're actually more related to horses. But this was found in North America about 35 million years ago. So if you were to go back to North America about 35 million years ago, you would find lush rainforests, animals like this Megacerops, and other smaller early rhinos. Understanding the world around us and finding ways to work together is the first step to save animals and habitats in the wild. We hope that you feel inspired to take action for black rhinos. We would like to take this opportunity to thank our conservation partners, the International Rhino Foundation and the Black Mambas, our AZA partners, the Caldwell Zoo, and our staff who work to make our mission come alive every single day. Thank you for coming along on today's journey and we hope that you'll join us for the next Hope for the Wild, Cotton Top Tamarins. <laughs>